Hi, my name is Kevin Vondro, Chief Lending Officer at Westfield Bank and host of Sharing Knowledge, a podcast series that brings you insight in banking from the perspective of business owners, insurance agents, and individuals from all backgrounds, but share that same passion for the pursuit of financial freedom. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about mergers and acquisitions. But before we start, let's introduce our guests. With us today, we have Scott Flickinger and Scott Dickey from UIS Insurance and Investments, and Mike Wagger, Market Leader for Agency Banking at Westfield Bank. So Scott and Scott, tell us about UIS and give us a, a background on what you guys do and what your role and responsibilities are there. So Scott Flickinger, I work at UIS Insurance and Investments. I oversee the accounting department on the management team and then heavily involved in the operations of the agency. Scott Dickey, work at UIS Insurance uh, on the management team. Uh, involved in production and in acquisitions. Thank you both. Mike, uh, you've been a member at Westfield Bank for some time now, so tell us about your role as, as market leader for agency banking. Thanks, Kevin. Happy to be here. Uh, as market leader for agency banking, I oversee our uh, business development uh, goals for uh, working with independent insurance agencies. So that encompasses lending, uh, deposits, and premium finance, and we work with agents all across the country. Well, thank you, and, and thank you for participating with us here today. So Scott and Scott, why don't you tell us how UIS got connected to, to Westfield Bank and, and how that relationship has started and, and how it's grown over the years. So over the years, um, going back, Scott and I both started in 2004. Time goes quick, but um, mine of my first recollections of Westfield Bank was as soon after I started, within that first year, we purchased an agency in, in Findlay, Ohio, and that's how we got to know the folks at Westfield Bank. Mike and some of the others were a very important part of the process and this ability to buy that agency. So the history, the relationship goes back a long way. And we're really involved with them because each one of us, uh, when we purchased stock as well in UIS Insurance, we also came to Westfield Bank and, and have our personal loans with Westfield Bank. And, and talking about acquisitions, you guys have made many acquisitions throughout the years. I don't know if you want to talk really high number with, with, with the number of acquisitions you've made. Well, we started in 1924, and I think the acquisitions really started in the 80s. And we've had, uh, to date, we're at 25 acquisitions. Oh, impressive. Like purchasing agencies, so yeah. Well, good. And, and talking about mergers and acquisitions, Mike, why don't you tell the audience really a, about that and give a really a background on mergers and acquisitions? Yeah, sure thing, Kevin. So. Mergers and acquisitions are really a strategy of one company buying another. Uh, as part of their growth strategy, uh, an agency will go after what's called organic growth, which is just writing business on their own, writing new insurance, getting new customers. But M&A really plays a key part in that growth. It's really a big shot in the arm for them to go out and acquire a company. And as maybe they grow on a normal year 5 or 10% a year, this can really be like a, a double growth uh, opportunity for them to acquire another company, add it to their uh, company, and, and get a big jump in growth. So mergers and acquisitions provide a lot of benefits for, for companies as, as they look to grow. Um, are there any other benefits, Scott, or Scott, uh, around mergers and acquisitions? I think one of the key things is, is you end up being able to expand your marketplace with different carriers. I mean, a lot of times when we're looking at ones, we're looking at ones that have similar carrier carriers that we have. That allows us to build, gain profitability, get a bigger standing with that carrier. And that's been very important to us over the years as we've continued to grow. It has. Now, when you look to enter into an acquisition or, or merge with an, another company, there's a lot of work with that and involved with that. So maybe talk about some of the teams and, and some of the roles and responsibilities of that support staff or, or team you've put together to help make those, those acquisitions successful. It starts early. I mean, first is more falls on the sales part when you go out and you're looking at, at potential sellers and, and they're wanting to talk and there's a group of us to go out and, and, and we'll speak with them and see what they're interested in. See if, if we have, if there's a lot of likeness, if, if we have similar backgrounds, if we feel like we could mesh. And then once we get involved, we start negotiating and then we'll bring a team in, Scott and, and a group of people and go ahead and. So it's kind of a twofold thing, like Scott said. I mean, he, he does, a lot of times him and some others do the legwork on the front end, getting to know the sellers getting to make sure that we have common business interests, operate somewhat similarly, maybe not exact. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of falls over to the other department, which usually ends up kind of falling on the accounting department, HR, and some other parts. We try to integrate them into our culture then once the deal is in place. And that's by far one of the biggest parts of the whole thing is getting them introduced into our culture, pulling them together and making them feel like they're part of what we call the family, the UIS family. 
culture. You mentioned culture. That's, that's, that's got to be key. And you're bringing two different cultures together. How important is that to, to mesh those, those, those two different business units or, or their cultures or ideas together? To it doesn't it? seem like a big deal to most, but it's one of the most invaluable parts when we start down this path is to get our people and their people to mesh. And when he says make them part of the family, it's it's so important to get, when you're looking to be a seller in this market, is to realize that it doesn't happen the day that you sell your business, your job's over. It's not. It, that's when it all begins. That's when we got to figure out a way to bring two businesses together and find what, to go down one path. It's, it's not easy. You mentioned, um, you know, like once that, that transaction takes place, it's not done for that seller. Um, a, a lot of times they're still involved with that. Um, Mike, you, you've, you've financed a, a lot of mergers or acquisitions with that. What, what are some of the roles that that seller um, takes place in as, as part of those, those transactions? Yeah, oftentimes, Kevin, the seller is the key driver of the success of the deal. Uh, as the buyer, as Scott and Scott will attest to, I mean, the, the, one of the key components to make sure that seller is sticking around for a period of time to make sure that the business transitions well, uh, not only from just a customer standpoint, but also from a culture standpoint, making sure the employees that are sticking around uh, are buying into the new culture of the new company. Um, you know, one of the, the things we look at uh, when, when there is a deal from a financing standpoint is, is there a non-compete or is there some type of agreement with the seller that will, that will bind him to the company for a period of time? And really, that's a key success to make sure the deal goes off as planned. You hit a good point there too, Mike, because when we talk about a good acquisition, a good merger, the key is it has to cash flow, and we'll get into that. But that also means that just because a key employee walks out, well, they may lose 15% of the business that day. Or if the seller decides he only wants to be there six months, we may lose 30% of the business. Then the cash flow changes and it may not work. So that's a monstrous concern of ours. No. And, and you guys have, have been through many, many uh, acquisitions in, in, in the past. So how has that seller been part of those, those transactions or, or what were their roles in, in some of those transactions? Each deal is similar in a lot of ways, but each deal is a little bit different. If the seller is willing to buy into the changes that need to be done to move the whole thing forward, it by far goes so much smoother. And we've, we've always had pretty good experiences. The sellers are usually ready to make a transition, and, and the more they help their current employees embrace the small changes we need to make to move forward, the better the whole, the whole process And you goes. said a huge word there. You said that seller's got to be ready, and, and he has to be able to, to step away. And take a, he's ran the business for so long to step away and now just let his employees learn a new culture. That's tough. No, no, I can imagine. Change is hard. Change can be yeah. hard. And, and if, if, if you have a seller that's not motivated to stay in or, 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 or be part of that, how do you protect that transaction as you go forward if they decide to leave? What are, what are some of the stipulations or, or things you can put in place to help, help really, really protect that purchase of, of that, uh, that new acquisition or of the company? Well, I think Mike touched on that a little bit earlier when he mentioned non-competes and some other things. That usually allows us to kind of retain the business. But our preference is, is when we do these kind of deals that, that the principals stay on for a period of time, two, three, maybe four years, help with the transition, make sure the customers understand it's, it's going to change, it's going to be different, but it's for the good. It's for your benefit. And that helps by far make sure that we hold on to that revenue. And it's on. our job to get out in front of that and so there are no surprises. We explain to them up front what we expect of them. Kevin, one of those tools is an employment agreement. So we talked about a non-compete, mm -hmm. which if that seller were to leave, they can't go right business against the company they just sold to. And it really protects the company of getting what they pay for. But an employment agreement will, will bind that seller to the company for two, three, or four years and spell out the terms of compensation, what he can and can't do, and really help reinforce that culture change. Yeah. And, and, and many times, I have to imagine, the value of that company is based on, a lot of it's based on that previous owner. And, and how he's ran that company and the success around that. Uh, speaking of, of evaluations, um, Mike, how important is it to, to get evaluation when you're looking at acquiring or, or, or buying an, another business? Well, valuation's you know, the key part of the deal. It's how much you're gonna pay for that business and what is it worth to you? And there's a lot of ways to arrive in getting there. Uh, some companies will do their own internal valuation methodology when we underwrite a loan. We have an internal valuation methodology, but sometimes uh, the, the particulars of the deal will, will require that you get an outside valuation, which is like an appraisal for your house. So there's a firm that you contract with, they'll go back and review everything about that company and assign a value to it. You'll know what the market value is. So if you're going to buy a home and you're going to get a mortgage, you're going to get an appraisal to know what your house is worth. 
And this is very much a similar case here where you have that valuation say, this is what the agency is worth on the open market. And, here's, and that gives the buyer really some guidelines of what to pay for it. Now, it doesn't mean they pay that exact price for it, you know, because the value to every buyer is different than what it may be to the seller. And usually there's some negotiation there, as Scott and Scott will attest. Um, and really it's, it's up to the buyer to make a, a good offer that the seller feels like he's getting good value, but the buyer's also getting good value and making that cash flow work for them. Sure. And, and I guess in your experience, um, Scott and Scott, um, in, in past acquisitions, what are some of the key components of evaluation or, or what impacts the value of that company that you guys are going to buy? Well, there's a lot, there's several different things. I mean, their revenue stream, what is it like? What carriers are it with? Is it more heavy commercial, personal lines? Do they have a book of financial services? Those, those components are very important or things that we look at when we start to look at an agency. Another, is it in our current footprint? Are we going to be able to bring them right into an agency that we currently have? Uh, it makes cash flow a lot easier when it's, when they come in and just coming into one of our existing agencies. And, and you mentioned that, is it, is it in your current footprint? Um, how, how much more difficult is it to, to, to I don't know, do a, a successful acquisition when you're, when you're across state lines or you're out of, the, out of the same county or zip code, but maybe it's even across state lines. I mean, how, how is that uh, managed successfully? It's just a different, well, preparation is different, is the best I can say, Kevin, because you've got to get ready. You've, you've got to know that the team's got to be traveling a lot. Uh, you're going into an area that you're not used to. It's exciting too, though. I think we find that to be, it's an exciting challenge to do that if we're going to be another hour to the south and, and knowing that we're going into a community we've never been in before. And, uh, I think Scott touched on it. Preparation's a big part of it. The farther we step outside maybe our current footprint or if you were to be looking at one and step outside your current footprint, it, it puts new obstacles on it. A little more travel time, a little, like Scott said, you got to integrate yourself into a different community. you got to get to know what's important around there so that you can fit in and, and it doesn't disrupt the current business that's there. Always growing pains because you're learning something new and it's, it's something you and I don't see each other every day, Kevin. It's learning, learning what you do and you're a little further away than what I'm used to. So they're just, sure. just different. Sure. Mike, I know, I know you've financed uh, transactions that have gone from East Coast to West Coast, um, uh, that, that, that far apart. Um, does that have any impact on the, on the valuation of the company when they're, when they're buying something that far away? You know, typically in the insurance space, it's not a huge impact, Kevin. Um, you know, one of the tenants and one of the great things about the insurance business is there's a renewable income stream. And that really carries a lot of weight. And so that transfers very easily whether you're on the East Coast or the West Coast. I think the challenge there is you have people who are a four and a half or five hour flight away from connecting uh, when you're that far apart. You know, an hour down the road is one thing, but to be, you know, uh, four hours in time difference, uh, there, there's a significant hurdle to overcome there. Now we've seen it done successfully. Uh, we've seen some that have hit bumpier roads than others, um, but but that shouldn't really impact the valuation too much. Okay. Is, is there anything that companies can do to improve the value of their, of their company if they're looking to sell um, in the next year or, or two? Some, maybe some advice you can give business owners? And I'll talk for the accountant and make him smile. Get your financials in order. That, that does amazing things. Would you agree? I would agree. It's one of those, uh, most of these insurance agencies are small business. They're, they're used to doing things a certain way, and when you start to put it out to maybe possibly sell and transition, some things you did in the past may not work going forward. So you just have to be prepared for that as you sit down to start to talk to somebody about possibly you know, selling your agency. Prepare your employees. Surprises yes, never big. turn out well. Mike, you mentioned reoccurring revenue, and, and I have to imagine that's really important um, in, in valuating a, a company. How important is the mix of the business, or, or, or you know, like the mix of insurance products that, that sure. a company is selling? Yeah, it's, it's certainly a factor. I mean, one of the things that we look for, Kevin, in our underwriting is, is there a heavy concentration in one line of business? So if you were an agency that had a heavy concentration in restaurants this year, that would probably impact your valuation right now. Um, now, if most agencies we have seen are very well diversified in multiple in, uh, industries, multiple lines of business, but we also look at concentrations, not just for business lines, but personal lines versus commercial lines. Are you all personal lines or all commercial lines, or is there a healthy mix? Do you have a heavy concentration with one carrier? So is 90% of your business written with one carrier? There's probably some risk to that because if that carrier changes their underwriting appetite or something similar, uh, that could impact your value as well. So one of the things that we look for in those valuations and what will really, uh, I think, push your value up 
as having a very well diversified book of business, a very well diversified stable of carriers. Certainly you want to have four or five key ones, key partners, uh, and then also a very well uh, good mix of personal lines versus commercial lines. Okay, good, thank you. So in, in your experience, um, both of you have been through a lot of, of, of acquisitions. Uh, what makes an acquisition successful versus what makes one unsuccessful? Are they prepared to sell? That's where it starts. Is your lending partner, do you have a good lending partner? That's huge. We happen to have one in Westfield Bank that works hand in hand with us. That matters. Have you prepared your staff? And are you open to letting someone else come in and run your business? Not take over your business, but run and merge and learn new things. Scott hit it on the head. You know, and it goes back to a little bit what we talked about before, which was culture. Integrating our, the new culture, but at the same time having that principal seller be willing to allow certain changes to happen. When they're used to being in control 24-7, 365 days a year, it's sometimes hard for them to let go. They have to be prepared to let a little bit of it go so that things move smoothly. Mike, in your experience, what, what have you seen in the past that's really made uh, an acquisition successful versus one that really didn't go as well as it, it could have? Well, I think they hit it on the head, too, is, is preparation, no surprises, getting your financials in order, uh, and, and, and really planning ahead. Uh, surprises are not good uh, for anybody. And, um, you know, having a, a, an advanced conversation with your team, the sellers, their team, your lending partner, carriers, everyone who's involved in that, having that advanced communication really makes a big difference. Uh, you know, purely from a lending standpoint, cash flow. We want to make sure there's enough cash flow generated to service any debt that's there to pay for it. So one of the things we look at is there enough cash flow that's generated. And, and really one of the, the benchmarks of a successful deal is generating enough return on your investment or enough cash flow that pays for it and, and then a little sum on top of that too. No. I know in order to make a, a, a transaction successful, you have to have a motivated seller and a motivated buyer. And a lot of times, a, a seller may think the value's here, and the buyer may think the value's here. Um, so how do, you, how do you guys come to terms on that and, and come to something that may be fair and equitable for, for both parties? Well, one thing you have to look at, Kevin, and Mike hit it dead on, is cash flow. Does the deal cash flow? That matters. And then you have to, as, as a seller, you have to decide, would you, do you want your employees to stay employed? Do you want to keep an office or move into one of our existing? And th those things matter. And it, it's something, if you want ultimate dollar, then, someone, then an agency is going to come along and they're going to ask you to shut your doors and they're going to take your revenue and go forward. But uh, that's the decision you have to make. And there's several decisions. I mean, you, we've had some good and we've had some bad. Go through yeah. some of the bad. So one of the things, and I know Mike touched on the, the diversity of your, your carrier portfolio, and one of the things is make sure the carriers are on board. I know we touched on it early that we like to find ones that fit us that have similar carriers. You know, sometimes you find one that has a carrier you don't have, and the first thing you got to do sometimes before you finish the deal is make sure that carrier is on board with being a partner with you, because if they're not, that can put a huge disruption on the business, and if there's financing involved, obviously that affects you know, the bank in that situation. So those, those are key important parts that need to be addressed early on. What you can't prepare for is if something doesn't work with one of the carriers and you have to roll a book of $4 million, that's, you can't prepare for that. Okay, good. Now you mentioned valuation, and, and I wanna go back to that, Mike, and, and ask you this. So, Scott mentioned cash flow, how important that is to, to the value of, of a company in a purchase. What are the, the key indicators really that, are, that drive that value um, of, a, of a company when, it, when you go to sell it? Yeah, well, historically, uh, most M&As were done with, based on a multiple of revenue. So that's the top line commission revenue. And deals have historically been traded for uh, two times revenue, let's say. Well, there's been a shift probably over the last 10 years to EBITDA because EBITDA is your cash flow and that's really the driver of the valuation. And so now most deals are done on a multiple of EBITDA and that's how we look at deals and value them internally and that's really what the valuation firms use as well is that multiple of EBITDA. So the really key thing to, to improve your valuation is focus on your EBITDA. Scott hit it on the head too, if you wanna sell for a sky high valuation, you can certainly do that, but they're gonna eliminate all of your expenses. It's gonna be your employees, your spaces, Anything you've built generally will go away to validate that high price. If it's important to the seller to keep his name on the door, keep some employees around for a while, there is certainly value to that to the buyer and the seller too, but that's going to result in a lower valuation typically. So it really comes down to what the seller is looking for, what the buyer wants out of it, and meeting somewhere in the middle. 
but ultimately from a value standpoint, EBITDA is the main driver of cash flow or of valuation. And that, that, that makes sense, uh, especially I guess when you have reoccurring revenue, because a lot of times you can't control that top line. It's, it's dictated elsewhere. So it's going to be more important is, is in the profitability of the business and in, in, in creating value there. Correct. Most agents retain anywhere between 85 and 90% of their business on any given year, sometimes higher, sometimes lower. So that revenue will continue coming in the door and what you can grow that organically with just is that much more. It's what you do with that top line revenue, how you manage your expenses that really uh, affect the value of your company. All right, Mike, you mentioned EBITDA when it, when it comes to valuing a, a company. Maybe tell our audience, what is EBITDA? What, what makes up EBITDA? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. That's, you know, it's an acronym that we use pretty freely here because we all understand it, but uh, EBITDA stands for your earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So it's basically it's your net income and your profit plus any non-cash expenses. So amortization is typically an accounting entry, uh, but it's not really use of cash. So we try and add that back to get to what the actual cash generated out of the business is. Okay. Now, when you think of, of mergers and acquisitions, um, and I'm gonna ask uh, either Scott this, do you think we're in a hard market or a soft market when it comes to the ability to, to, to buy or purchase a business? If you look at the baby, baby boomer generation, you could say that in the next 10 years, there's going to be a lot of opportunities. So I'd say we're in the soft market when it comes to the chance of acquisition in the next 10 years. And sellers, they're, they're pretty excited as well because top dollars out there right now. So yep. that's for sure. Okay. Well, I do want to thank our guests for joining us today. But before we leave, I guess I just want to ask one more question or, or what advice would you give our viewers today that are, are preparing for a purchase or an acquisition of a company, or maybe even selling a company. You know, it kind of goes back to what we talked to before. Okay, kind of get get your financial position in order the way you want it. It helps your value, increase your EBITDA. As as Mike said, that'll be a very important driver in what you're going to get if you put it out to for bid or to sell it. I think that's a huge piece of the whole puzzle. I, I make sure you're ready to do this. Make sure once you commit that you're 100% committed to sell, and to move into someone else's culture and be prepared to accept them and help your employees grow with the other agency that purchases you or company that purchases you. I echo that. I mean, preparation is key on both sides, really, from a buyer and a seller standpoint. The seller has to be ready to go. The seller has to have reconciled with himself or herself, you know, how much do I want and when am I ready to sell and how do I want to get paid and, and have those factors ready to go. And those are the main drivers of the deal. But having the preparation, you know, from the buyer standpoint as well of, talking to your partners, planning in advance, and having your financial house in order uh, is, is really kind of the, the key starting points for making a deal successful. It is, Mike, because it, and I'll, I'll say it's a different, most banks are used to something that's attached to assets. This is a different look when it's a revenue stream. And unless you have a good lending partner, Westfield Bank's very comfortable with revenue streams, and I'm not sure all banks are, so. No. And, and, and I heard both sides on in looking at this um, from, and when I mean both sides, from the buying and the financing is, is, is preparation, right, is important. It's, it's something that can't be done tomorrow. It, it's got to be thought out over a period of time. And you really have to have two motivated parties that are going to work together. But I think the biggest thing or takeaway I, I heard is no two, no two deals are alike, right? So you have to treat each opportunity different and prepare for it totally different as you go forward. So. Every agency may sell the same thing, insurance, but they're all different. And every deal, therefore, is different too. Well, before we, we end, we always ask our guests to, to talk about a watch list, something they're looking at in, in, in out there, in whether it's in the economy or just in, in, in general. So Scott Flickinger, why don't you tell us what's on your watch list and what you think viewers, or, or what's important for viewers to, to look for? I think it's as we kind of leave 2020 and into the first part of 21, we're still in the midst of a pandemic. How does it affect business? How does it affect the insurance industry? Um, you know, it's, we did all right through 2020, but we're not sure where we're headed in 21. Hopefully better, hopefully with uh, vaccinations and the virus kind of hopefully heading in another direction. We'll see where that takes us and takes the economy going forward. Good. Good. Scott Dickey, what's on, on your list? In the last couple of months, if you haven't seen the uptick on, on attacks in, in, in the cyber region, it, it's a monstrous problem in our in, in the country right now and probably across the, in the world because even if you take a look at what this pandemic's done and in Ohio here, even our governor received an unemployment notification that it's, the attacks are coming everywhere. 
and you need as a business to get prepared for such things because you don't think it will hit you until it does. Well, you bring up a, a great point, Scott. As the world becomes more virtual, um, there is a lot more risk around cybersecurity. In fact, that's what we did on our, our previous podcast was around cybersecurity and some tips that businesses can, can do to help prevent uh, any issues around cybersecurity. So, Mike, let's, let's reach out to you and, and see what's on your watch list. Well, really, I think Scott's right. You know, we're still in a pandemic, and, and I think, you know, we're all probably suffering a bit from pandemic fatigue. So we're probably all ready to move on past it. So I'm hoping that, uh, you know, that, that's my watch to see when that happens and we can kind of emerge from some of those things. The other piece of it from a financial standpoint is what's, what's the tax landscape going to be going forward? One of the key parts of the election was the difference in, in tax plans, and I think uh, we're in an environment where taxes are going to go up. Uh, and so how does that affect not only individuals, but businesses and future transactions? So. No, that's, that's all good. And really all, along that, Mike, mine's very similar, is what's this new administration going to do? How's it going to impact taxes? But not only taxes, what's really close to me is interest rates. Um, well, how that how it's going to impact that and then the affordability that it's going to be for, for customers to continue to, to, to pay debt in the future. So again, thank you. Thank you all for, for joining us here today on, on our speaker series podcast that we focused on mergers and acquisitions. Thanks, Kevin. Sharing Knowledge is brought to you by Westfield Bank, hosted by Kevin Vondro, Chief Lending Officer. From the imagination and creativity of Chris Van Osdale, Elise Love, Suzanne Favre, Corinne Wilson, a marketing communications strategist at Westfield Bank. Produced, edited, and mixed by Shark and Minnow. Learn more at westfield-bank.com. Sharing knowledge and shedding light on the financial industry to empower financial freedom. The Sharing Knowledge series of videos, podcast episodes, and articles are for informational purposes only and is not intended to serve as legal, tax, financial investment, accounting, or regulatory advice. Opinions expressed and third-party information shared herein do not reflect the opinions of Westfield Bank, Westfield Group, or any of its subsidiaries or affiliates. The information shared does not constitute nor is intended as an offer or solicitation for the purchase or sale of any product or service. Testimonials may not be representative of the experience of other customers and are not guarantees of future performance or success. Bank products and services provided by Westfield Bank, member FDIC, an equal opportunity lender.